topics for today are primarily going to be ritual and myth. Ritual is often dismissed as superstitious behavior. Myth is seen as fantasy. Scientists, including most paranormal researchers, give them very little attention. Yet, for thousands of years, humans have used rituals to control, influence, and channel supernatural and paranormal forces. They have used myths to describe, explain, and understand those forces. So it makes sense to try to understand earlier cultures. The goals for this lecture are four. I'd like you to be exposed to certain concepts and terms. I'd like you to be able to recognize names of a few theorists. And I'd like you to become aware of certain relevant literature. I have a suggested reading list on that back table. <coughs> the understanding of these concepts is not a goal. Many of you probably won't understand everything I say. But that's OK. I want you to hear the names and see them. This will be quite academic, theoretical, and abstract. I have four topics I'd like to cover. Uh, binary oppositions, liminality and antistructure, the structuralist intellectual lineage, and ontology. I'd like to start at the end because I'd like to see, like you to know where I'm going with the lecture. Although that's probably not the logical sequence. I'd like to start with this man, Jacques Derrida. Uh, he is probably best known as the founder of deconstruction. He was arguably the world's most prominent and influential living philosopher in the last quarter of the 20th century. His works have been vigorously debated in comparative literature, law, geography, music, business management, architecture, religious studies, ethnography, theology, communication studies, among many others. In 1994, 20 years ago, this book, Specters of Marx, became available in English. <coughs> now Derrida did not use the word specters for just a catchy title. This book is all about specters. In fact, the word spirit or spirits appear more than 230 times in the book. <coughs> The word ghost or ghost more than 350 times. He cites spiritualists and their dancing tables, mentions revenants, conjuring, exorcisms, as well as Victor Hugo's seances. This book introduced the term ontology, which is a near hominid ontology. Google Scholar reports that Spectres of Marx has been cited over 4,000 times. This book is now the foundational text for the academic work on ghosts. So, how do parapsychologists and psychical researchers receive Derrida? Well, I looked at electronic searches of these four journals, the Journal of the SPR, the Journal of Parapsychology, the European Journal of Parapsychology, and the Journal of Scientific Exploration. Only the JSE mentioned him, and only three times, and only in passing. <clears throat> so, where did Derrida come from? Well, he falls within the intellectual lineage known as structuralism. Structuralism's roots trace back about 100 years to linguistics and anthropology. And I will go on into some detail on this later. <coughs> Structuralism is a little bit different than most other scientific disciplines. It tends to emphasize more the system than the component. The collective rather than the individual is more holistic than atomistic. And it emphasizes the social rather than psychological. These are general trends and there are certainly some exceptions. Now structuralism can be quite abstract. And I like to compare it to differential equations used in engineering. Buildings and earthquakes, certain electrical circuits, and water flowing through reservoirs and pipes are all governed by the same differential equations. Building an earthquake is a good example. Uh, under normal static conditions, the design of the top beam of the structure is really quite a straightforward process, not a big deal. But under earthquake conditions, it is very, very different. 
because the stiffness of these lower columns are crucial to understanding and being able to calculate the load placed on that top beam. The structure must be analyzed as a whole. Structuralism is rather similar. It reveals commonalities in language and myth and ritual and social structure, commonalities that are not apparent on the surface. Now, a major theoretical concept I'd like to introduce is that of binary oppositions. And earlier this morning, we heard a little bit about binaries and their use today. Binaries are commonly discussed in cultural studies, feminist studies, American Indian studies, gender studies, African American studies, and quite a few others. And many of these fields that use this concept focus on marginalized and minority groups. And the concept has proved really quite fruitful. Uh, an early ex example of the use in a paranormal field is uh, David Hess's book, Science in the New Age. Uh, and the post-structuralist influence in this book is seen throughout. Uh, by the way, uh, Hess studied parapsychology at JFK University, and that's a fact that does not appear on his CV today. <laughs> uh, binary oppositions are found in a large number of cultures, and particularly within their classification schemes. But today, many of the people who use the concept of binary oppositions are not really aware of its history. Earlier cultures often divided the world and the universe into a series of binaries. Life, death, God, human, heaven, earth, male, female, human beings. Uh, the top row of elements typically have greater power, prestige, and privilege. There is a hierarchy. There are power relations in this display. And if two elements of a particular binary are about equal in power, you typically have an unstable condition. We often think of these binaries as clearly distinct and separate. And there is a large betwixt and between area. And that betwixt and between area is also referred to as liminal. <coughs> So, what do we find in this betwixt and between area? Well, between the heavens and the earth, there are angels and UFOs. Between God and human are mystics. Mystics strive to become one with the divine. And it is among mystics that we found, find some of the most powerful paranormal phenomena ever reported, such as levitation. In American Indian tribes, there were people known as the Burdach, who took the role of the opposite sex. Many of those people became shamans, and those who did not were still looked upon as having supernatural power. Between human and beast, there were counts of werewolves, vampires, Bigfoot. And between life and death, there are ghosts, mediums, spirits, near-death experiences all challenge the distinction between life and death. This liminal domain, though, has some special and unusual properties. This area is explicitly non-rational. But this display here, which I've used many times in years past, is really a bit too simplistic. It's not really reflective of the reality. The reality is this display a little bit better by this. <laughs> These categories within this liminal realm tend to blur. Betty and Barney Hill had poltergeist experiences. UFO flaps may be accompanied by Bigfoot sightings. Many of the US government psychic spies have had UFO encounters. Medias can channel spirits, but they also channel ET. <coughs> Some of them even channel Bigfoot. Now I could go on and on and on about this blurring. But if you go to the major conferences of the big name organizations like the PA, Parapsychological Association, or MUFON, you hear very little about that blurring. The top people of the organizations are generally quite hostile talking about this. The Journal of Parapsychology, a couple years ago, ran a book review denouncing Stephen, uh, Steve Levy's, or Stephen uh, 
the cringeology book, uh, Stephen Volk, uh, denouncing the fact that he put information on UFOs in his book with, with stuff on parapsychology. Tabloid journals generally understand this mixing a whole lot of science. <laughs> now, people associated with this, people, there are, these are either phenomena or people closely associated with the phenomena uh, of the paranormal. And these people are typically marginal. They are, in fact, marginality is really a key to understanding the paranormal generally. The paranormal and its practitioners have been socially marginal for thousands of years. This is not a new phenomenon. Uh, Sir Edmund Leach was the leading British structural anthropologist, and he had some very important insights into binary oppositions. He wrote, in every myth system, we will find a persistent sequence of binary discriminations followed by a mediation of paired categories thus distinguished. Mediation, in this sense, is always achieved by introducing a third category, which is abnormal or anomalous in terms of ordinary rational categories. Thus, myths are full of fabulous monsters, incarnate gods, virgin mothers. This is, the middle ground is abnormal, not natural, holy. It is typically the focus of all taboo and ritual. Binaries are also very important for understanding ritual. In fact, liminality theory was derived directly from the study of ritual. Victor Turner did some of the most important work on ritual. He wrote, they, the initiates, are associated with such general oppositions as life and death, male and female, food and excrement, simultaneous Blurring and merging of distinctions may characterize the The concept of binary oppositions also helps explain some of the classification problems in parapsychology. <coughs> Yesterday we saw a few classification schemes. This is pretty much the traditional one that professional parapsychologists have had for decades. Yet Psi has two types, the SP and the PK. Three types of DSP, telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. Two types of PK, micro and macro. But if we look at these types of sign within the framework of binaries, they display it this way. Between self and other, there's telepathy. Whose thoughts am I thinking? Between present and future, precognition, it challenges that distinction. Between physical and mental, we have PK. PK, is, is it a mental process, physical process, what is it? Between present and absent, clairvoyance. But again, this is a bit too simplistic. In reality, we can find something more like this. Any type of side type can be explained by combinations of the other, or other types. This has been understood within professional parapsychology for many decades. And this is clearly a frequently acknowledged problem among the professionals. The same problem has afflicted survival research for over a century. The book by Frank Podmore, Telepathic Hallucinations, The New View of Ghosts, published in 1909. Now I admit Julie Beichel may be making some progress. I do have uh, some reservations. I hope she succeeds, but uh, I think there are some philosophical and technical objections, uh, but she might be able to resolve it. But this has been a major issue, and the debates have continued within the professional journals for over a century. Let's return to liminality, because there are a number of synonyms uh, for liminality, uh, and I'm not going to be able to go in depth and explain it. But I do believe the most important one is the concept of anti-structure, uh, whose term was coined by Victor Turner, uh, and he used it in the subtitle of his book, The Ritual Process. Anti-structure manifests in a number of ways, especially with groups. Ghost research groups, parapsychology laboratories, spiritualist churches, and magical groups directly attempt to engage paranormal forces. 
but they almost never build long-lasting institutions with paid staff and buildings. One notable exception I can point to is the Church of Scientology. <laughs> then look at anti-structure in regard to institutions. <coughs> there are no university departments devoted to psychical research. The number of U.S. scientists employed full-time to attempt to elicit and directly observe psi occurrences, probably less than five. There are no major corporations that publicly acknowledge using psychics, and major religions discourage the pursuit of psychic abilities. Psi is marginal. Its overt use lies outside of today's bureaucratic institutions. Engagement with paranormal forces <coughs> has consequences. There are side effects. Anti-structure and paradrama are two of those side effects. Ghosts have effects, and other cultures recognize that fact. David Hicks observed it in his fieldwork described it in his book, Keaton, Ghosts, and Kim. Ghosts will be able to appear in and around the hamlets and can plague their kin, since this interaction between ghosts and humans happens outside ritual. This particular type of union becomes malignant instead of beneficial, destructive instead of creative. Quarrels between kin intensify. This is a wonderful example of character. Let's return to Edwin Leach. This middle ground is abnormal, non-natural, holy. It is typically the focus of all taboo and ritual observance. So, the question becomes, are there dangers in psychical research? Let us remember the death of Elizabeth Carr, the spindrift suicides, the incarceration of Dan Worth, the Geraldo Rivera expose of Gary Schwartz, and the recent conviction of Melvin Morris. In my years in the field, I've been involved in maybe 20 to 30 haunting poltergeist cases. That's a really rough estimate. But it's probably somewhere in that range. But in three of those cases, people involved later went to prison. Two of them for murder. And in a fourth case, a murder was later committed at the investigation. <coughs> in my experience, there have been enough adverse events for me to be a bit concerned. Okay, I'd like to take a break from the structuralist, from liminality, and go into the structuralist intellectual lineage. If you're going to pursue the topics I'm raising here today, you'll need some background in your reading to kind of get to follow the literature. And I will warn you, this lineage is rather messy. The central figure in this lineage is Claude Lévi-Strauss. Lévi-Strauss was a member of Académie Française, as well as the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. There is no Nobel for anthropology. Nearly all dis discussions of structuralism focus on its linguistic group, starting with Ferdinand de Saussure. It's not so common to encounter mention of the British structuralist, Leach, Needham, and Douglas, and Turner and Van Gennep are almost virtually never included. However, as far as ritual goes, <clears throat> Durkheim discussed collective effervescence, Van Gennep, liminality. Durkheim's elementary forms was translated into English within three years. Van Gennep's rites of passage took more than 50. Yet Van Gennep had the far, far deeper in understanding of ritual. Now, the literary linguistic and philosophical line of structuralism is displayed here. And this is the line that gets the overwhelming attention. And all post-structuralists will be familiar with the names on this slide. 
the primary binary associated with this particular lineage is signifier and signify. Note, there is a betwixt and between. This binary is all about the limits of language, the problem of meaning, and the crisis of representation. Divination systems are all about this binary. Synchronicity <coughs> is all about this binary. The science wars of the 1990s were all about this binary. Which element belongs on top? Levi Strauss was clear. Mana, or magical power, lies between, it took in between, this binary. This binary comes from semiotics. Both co-founders of semiotics were directly involved with psychical research. Sashore was involved with E.T. mediumship a half a century before Roswell. Ontology emerged from the literary line of structuralism. At the beginning of this presentation, I discussed specters and marks. And admittedly, this is quite a difficult book. There is a more accessible one. And that book is Ghostly Matters. Avery Gordon, who's a professor of sociology at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Her book was published in 1997. Like Derrida, as far as I can tell, she's been completely ignored. Google Scholar reports that the book has received over a thousand citations. Gordon's approach is highly theoretical. She was trained in a Marxist tradition. There's a lot she does not understand about ghosts. But her theoretical perspective gives her enormous advantages. She understands that major binaries can be blurred and subverted. She understands those are not discrete. She understands that ghosts are fundamentally social. She has a very deep understanding of marginality. Like Derrida, she understands the importance of Karl Marx. She's examined extreme cases that disappeared in Argentina and slavery in this country. She understands an enormous amount about power relations. Power relations, binary oppositions, and marginality are all key to understanding the paranormal. Time is growing short, so I would like to leave you with a few words from Avery Gordon.